Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, second day of the workshop of instabilities in financial market. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Don Farmer that I know and I collaborate with from 10 years, I was realizing this morning. No, yeah, it was 2002, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. And so it's a very great pleasure for me to uh, invite him to deliver his talk to this meeting, please. Well, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. Very nice to be in Pisa. So today I'm going to try and tie several ideas together. And um, I'm going to begin by discussing the idea of market impact, which in a sense was originally developed or proposed by Pete Kyle. Um, but I'm going to argue that market impact's a really useful tool when you want to think about financial instabilities. And in particular, I'm going to discuss three different proposals in some detail. Um, a proposal that accounting should be done taking market impact into account rather than the usual mark-to-market -market way. Um, a discussion about leverage as a critical phenomenon, showing how just the impact of traders can cause institutions to fail simply because they're using too much leverage and don't understand impact. And then I'm going to talk about what I think is the primary vector of financial contagion during the crisis, which is overlapping portfolios and the role in systemic risk, using market impact as the tool to, uh, to develop that. So first of all, what, what is market impact and what form does it take? So market impact, we're going to call what, what Pete was yesterday calling expected shortfall, though there are nuances in which thing you talk about, do you talk about the impact of your own trades or, or the effect on other prices? For now, let's just think about implementation shortfall. And so we can define this to be, and I'll just shout, the impact is the expected value of the change in price divided by the price with this epsilon just to flip the sign between buying and selling. So in other words, you snapshot the price before you make the trade or before you think about the gap use Pete's firm, and then you wait and see what some final price is, and you can, depending on what you're thinking about, you might have a different definition for this price, but let's think of this as the last price in the sequence of trades that are associated with given path, and, and so this is the market impact. Now, um, early theories like Pete's postulated that this should be linear, and um, there's even an argument that looks very powerful by Huberman and Stancil arguing that you should have arbitrage if this isn't linear. But when you look empirically, you definitely, you do not see a linear function. Um, now, the reason I argue this is true is because liquidity isn't remaining constant during the execution of the order, and that's assumed either implicitly or explicitly in, in these theories. It's assumed explicitly in the Huberman and Stancil one. Um, and I can go back and, and discuss that if there are questions. But, but and there's several proposals for market impact. Um, I list on here two theories. One is due to uh, Fabrizio and me and Austin Gehrig and, and Henry Walbrook. And another one is due to Benz Toth and Je several people in Jean-Philippe Bouchot. And there's also one that uh, Pete mentioned yesterday due to Gabex and Stanley's group. Um, uh, so there have been, there, and there's actually several other competing theories, but I think there is a consensus settling in towards an impact function of this form. Um, while I like our theory, I actually also think the theory of Bouchot is very compelling. And uh, because it's based on a no arbitrage idea. But the proposal is that they're at least under normal conditions, where normal conditions mean that you always stay within about 20%, 10 or 20% of daily volume, uh, which is, by the way, what you see when you look at data. Most, most people who trade, you rarely see trades that consume more than 20% of the daily volume. That is, if you look at, you know, you get some data from a brokerage, so you can actually see the bets as opposed to the individual trades. And you know that this series of trades is associated with somebody who's just buying, buying, buying in the market. You rarely see one agent consuming more than about 20%. Um, but they do go up to 20% quite often. Um, so the formula that's proposed is that the impact as a function of the size of the trade Q is some constant Y 
times the standard deviation times the square root of the Q over the volume. And you have to take these in consistent units, so if this is the daily standard deviation, this would be the daily trading volume. And, and just to comment, one of the, the nice things about this proposal is that it, it, it and actually that's true of both of our proposals, that this function is not just a function of the final amount, it also holds at intermediate points. That is, if you plot this as a function of the um, amount that's been traded so far, you get the same square root behavior. Now, let me just say, I think it would be interesting. I, I, I from listening to your talk yesterday, Pete, I, I haven't really figured out whether this is, is consistent with what you're saying in, in your talk. That is, um, this is sort of addressing a different thing. And, and because this constant y can change from market to market, although part of the argument is that y is staying in roughly the same ballpark as you move from market to market. But it's not, it's not clear to me whether this is in principle consistent with what you're saying or not. And um, I think it would be very interesting to do some head-to-head -head tests if it's not. But do you have a comment on that? Ah, okay, so it is consistent. It's consistent. Right. But we would be doing away information, meaning that if you looked at it stock by stock, the Y should be, Y is more than the mean more than Uh-huh, right. Um, okay. Um, let me say one thing, one thing that I'm not sure is consistent from, from listening to what you were saying yesterday is that um, uh, what is observed and what this also predicts is that execution rate doesn't affect your in impact. And we've tested that. We don't have a published paper on it, but that's roughly what we've seen. That it's, it's very, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're taking 1% of daily volume or 10% of daily volume, you get about the same impact in the end. There is some threshold where it must shoot up. And I think that's, a, that's actually what you were talking about yesterday were fire cell situations where this formula is out the window. But what I'm going to talk about today, I'm, I'm mainly, with some exceptions, I'll make, going to assume this formula. Now, let me just give you a picture. This is from a paper that, again, Fabrizio and I are co-authors on with a long list of others. But it gives you the idea. We look, we pulled stocks from the Spanish stock market and the London stock market. And what you see is that um, up to the period where the trade completes, you see the impact building. After the trade completes, you see some reversion. Actually, our theory predicts that that reversion should be around two-thirds the values that we see, or actually to revert to a third of the value at the peak. And um, that's roughly consistent with what we see, all the, the error bars are large, and these kind of things are hard to test, because as you move away, prices are diffusing, and things are getting noisier and noisier, so these statistical tests are, are not, um, not simple. Okay, but that's actually not so, the reversion isn't important for what I'm going to talk about today. We're really focusing on the period where this is building up, where I think the empirical results in the theories seem to be converging, and out here, all bets are off still. Long story aside about uh, this collaboration, that um, we don't we didn't do the best empirics, in my opinion, in this paper. But but nonetheless, something like this is. I mean, qualitatively at least, this is right. Rama. Well, I understand. That's right. Right. So I, I do, I am believe, I mean, any, of, any of the power law functions will have the property that for small trades you have infinite impact. I'm going to come back to why that's important in a minute. And, um, oops, wait, I don't want to show that yet. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. Um, but um, what did I want to say? Um, 
Our theory actually doesn't say it's exactly a square root unless a certain exponent is exactly a half. And, and it, which that is the, the long memory of the order flow. But the, I'm kind of getting into details that probably aren't so important for the rest of my talk here. But do, do, you, have, do you still have a question, Rama? Yeah. I think as an approximation, at least, that's, that's what's going on. It may just be an approximation because, of course, as you get close enough to the spread, the, 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 the assumptions of these theories go out the window once you get too far inside the spread, which is where this infinity would be happening. But, but let's go forward. So um, I just want to mention that I think it's very important to know the functional form of this, this. Now, I've had many financial economists tell me, well, that's not an interesting question. Uh, it's not worthy of a paper in a, quote, top journal because it's, that's, I don't know, it's a detail or what, but in fact, and, and I, even more strongly, I had, we, this is from a, a, a referee report of a paper we submitted to reviews of financial studies that was rejected. And, and the referee said, in the introduction, the authors mentioned that studying the shape of the price impact function for meta orders is important since, quote, market impact reflects the shape of excess demand. I simply do not understand this point. What does it mean? This is, to me, a kind of testament of how far removed economics has gotten from finance because finance people think about this in informational terms and they say this is a statement about the information in the market. Um, economists might think about this in supply and demand terms and if you think about uh, you know, this is a substitute for excess demand. If you just perturb excess demand, you can ask, if I, somebody enters with some more demand, how does that affect the price? So I argue that's what market impact is about. And let me just state, again, some unpublished results of both Henry Wellbrook, Jean-Philippe Bouchot. They made a bunch of random trades. You know, no correlations to anybody's strategy. According to standard finance theories, those trades should be uninformed. They should have no market impact. They look just like all the other trades in terms of their market impact. They have the exact same function. So market impact, I think, is much more about excess demand. And um, you, you perturb the market, how much does it change? Market impact has a functional form in the scale, but a floating reference point, because you're, in a sense, taking the derivative. Um, the claim that's being made is it's a universal function, functional form. It's not just a stylized fact, it's a fact. And, let me stress this point. I mean, like I said, a lot of economists have said, well, you know, why is this interesting? And I, to me, I have a hard time answering the question because it seems so obvious. But it's like, you know, if you'd gone up to Newton and said, you know, New you know Isaac, is it important that you have a one over R squared law for force? And you'd go one over R, one over R squared, whatever. Uh, it does matter. You know, the solar system is unstable if it's one over R two plus epsilon or two minus epsilon. Uh, I don't think it's quite that sensitive here, but I do think the functional form has a lot of consequences like the ones Rama was referring to. Um, market impact, to, my, to me, is both the friction and the motive force. On one hand, people usually think of market impact as a transaction cost, a slippage, it's a friction. On the other hand, market impact is also what makes the market move. It drives the market dynamics because transactions cause price movements, price movements cause transactions, and transactions cause price movements. And so you can think about what's happening in the market that way. Um, you need to know it if you're gonna try and optimize your trading. That's why, how I originally came to do this. You need to know it if you wanna know how much you should trade. If you're a hedge fund and you're trying to decide how much many, money you can manage, you better understand your market impact because that determines that. Because there's, there's a, a plot you can make. It, you know, if you're trading a small amount, you're not making as much profit as you can because if you traded twice the shares, you'd make twice the profit. But if you start to trade a lot, you start to lower your gain per trade to the point where there's an optimum in the middle and that optimum depends on the functional form of market impact. And at Prediction Company in 1996, when we were worrying about this, we were in a situation where, since we were essentially a prop trading group, we could get as much money as we wanted to trade. All we had to do was convince uh, SBC, later came UBS, that we could handle the money and they would just give it to us. And um, so this was a key question for us and actually discovering that this was a concave function um, rather than a linear function or even a, a super linear function as we imagined made a huge difference. It meant we could trade a lot more than we thought. Um, so, that is to say, market impact is setting the size, I call this allometry, because allometry is about the question of why are organisms the size that they are, and 
market impact is about why funds are the size that they are. Although this also has a lot to do with random diffusion as I have a paper with Yoni Schwartzberg uh, explaining that. But key thing about market impact is it allows you to understand market ecologies. Um, and let me just say some more about that because I think that's kind of essential here. Um, there's something I've been calling the Friedman paradox, and which is that market efficiency requires arbitrageurs, but arbitra arbitrageurs require inefficient markets to keep them motivated. If there's no money to be made in the market, all the arbitrageurs will go home, and so there's no reason to believe the market should be efficient anymore. Now, by the way, if anybody can help me track this down, uh, Shireen Joshi, who was my student, originally showed me a quote that was due to market Friedman, and I lost it, and I've never found the original quote again. Uh, Milton Friedman, excuse me. Um, but the, to a, the way a physicist might put this is markets are efficient at first order, but they've got to be inefficient at second order. So they're pretty efficient, but they can't be fully efficient. Um, and the way I think about these inefficiencies is that they're, they're driven by demand for liquidity and diversification, and this supports a rich ecology of predators, which are you know, most of the investment banks and hedge funds and so forth. Um, and as we know from ecology, actually, the, an ecology of predators is very important in keeping the ecosystem organized in a sensible way. So predator, in this sense, doesn't mean something bad, it means something good. Um, market impact, as I showed in this paper I referenced in 2002, allows you to sort of compute the market food web because you can reduce things to pairwise interactions. You can basically ask questions like, if this guy over here gets a little more money, and to invest, how does this affect all the other players in the market? And so you can organize pairwise, oh, these two strategies have a competitive reaction, a, a competitive interaction, these strategies have a predator-prey interaction, et cetera. And um, you can do things that ecologists do, like ask, given this ecology, if we inject the following new strategy, will it invade or not? Now you can see that this is inherently a non-equilibrium inefficient kind of analysis because if the market was full, fully efficient, nobody would ever be able to invade. Um, that is, you'd never be able to make up a new strategy that would, uh, but I, I'm maybe drifting away a little bit from the topic of financial instability. Um, but let me just say there's a hypothesis that's been made by several people, including Blake LeBaron in particular, and me, that market crises are driven by disruptions of the ecology or at least many market crises or some market crises. That you've got this ecology that's delicately balanced, something happens in the market to disrupt it, like an innovation, like mortgage-backed securities and subprime, the ecology gets distorted, and then funny things happen. Um, but it's very vague because I have to say to empirically study this, we need data with counterparty identifiers because if you don't have the counterparty identifiers, it's like trying to study the interactions of animals in a forest where you can't distinguish a rabbit and a fox. You just know some animal interacted with some other animal. You actually need to know what kind of animals you're looking at. So um, that's something I'm in a constant search for is data with counterparty identifiers. Now, let me just step back and make a comment about this, which is the Friedman paradox implies, as I said, there's always inefficiencies in second order. One can ask the question, when we're talking about financial instability, is that something that happens in an efficient market or not? And if it doesn't, that is, as I believe, that the financial instabilities depend on these second order effects, then to understand them, we really need to understand the ecologies that we're looking at in, in some detail. Um, let me just make the caveat too that when I'm talking about efficient at first order and inefficient at second order, I'm talking about informational efficiency. That is, are there arbitrages or at least pretty good trading, trading strategies that make money with a high sharp ratio? How is it different from the Postman thesis paper 1980 to show that the efficient market is Yeah, I should be referencing them here too. I should be referencing them. Yeah, it's the same, same basic idea, same basic idea. No, he, it just it was an offhand comment. Yeah. Of a Friedman's paper. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's 1953. Okay, great. Thank you. 
So now, I want to show you what some, some getting to financial instability, what this idea is good, good for. Um, and Fabrizio, actually, if you can give me a warning in about 15 or 20 minutes, when I have 15 or 20 minutes left, that would be good. Um, so one idea, one thing it's good for is to change the way we do accounting. Right now, you typically do accounting using mark to market, which is an intrinsically marginal idea. You ask, if I went out and sold one share, what price would I get for that share? And then you mark all the shares in your portfolio to that price. But since there's market impact, in fact, you're not going to be able to sell all those shares at that price. And so you're overvaluing your portfolio when you do that. And practitioners know this, but I think we should start taking advantage of what we've learned about market impact to do this quantitatively. And so in particular, if you, have a, if you want to think about what is the uh, impact-based valuation for your portfolio, you ought to imagine selling off the whole portfolio and looking at the, the, the value of that portfolio when you sell the whole thing off. So you estimate it using the market impact rule. And um, so you imagine, say, making a sequence of trades to liquidate the securities in your portfolio. Let's start by just assuming a portfolio with one security. And so you make a sequence of trades, as I've shown this sum up here, and the impact is accumulating. It's made one more, more trade, so it's the, the size of each share times the initial price times the amount of price is going down as you sell them off, which you can then go to a continuous limit put in the market impact function, and you then end up with a valuation for your portfolio that has, that would be this if you had no impact, but includes this correction term due to the impact. So our proposal is very simple. If you want to value your portfolio, use the average liquidation price rather than the current marginal price, and you're going to get a lower valuation. So we think this is a good thing to do. Now, um, how does that interact with leverage? So what I'm going to do now is compare leverage when, if you're computing your leverage as you go along in the market under mark-to-market -market valuation versus using a market impact valuation. And so first of all, I write the formula there for leverage. Um, it's a standard formula. It's the value of, of um, your assets. Uh, well, it's, it's just, I give the formula here. It's the value of the position times the value the loan you took plus whatever cash you have on hand. And a couple of properties of this that are important, if you hold the total size, I'm sorry, I changed my notation here on the slide. If you hold this constant, then the leverage decreases when the price of the asset increases. So in other words, if prices go up, your leverage is going to go down. Um, and vice versa, if um, prices go down, then your leverage goes up. If you hold prices constant and you hold the size of the money you borrow constant, then um, selling shares is going to reduce leverage as you raise cash. And now what I'm going to show you is under market impact, strange things happen to this formula. Um, let me just say that we alternatively can have an impact adjusted version of this where we write down exactly the same formula but put in this P tilde. Now, let's imagine first buying into and then selling out of a position. So. Imagine that what you do is you start your position at zero, you buy into it, so little Q now goes up to capital Q, and then you sell back out of it and you go back down to zero. Now let's look at what happens to your leverage under three different ideas about what's going on. One is that you're managing, you know, you're, 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 you're magical and you can sell without market impact and buy and sell without market impact. In that case, your leverage will just go up linearly and go back down linearly. All right? Now, what, what happens under mark-to-market -market accounting? Well, as you're buying into the position, you're buying, so you're pushing the price up. So as you push the price up, you're pushing your leverage down relative to where it would be if there were no market impact. So you now see a discrepancy that your leverage ends up being less than what it really ought to be uh, when you get there. But actually, it's even worse than that. Because what you can see, if you look now at our impact-adjusted formula, because you're, we're now taking into account the fact that uh, you're artificially depressing the prices, because we're now thinking ahead to what will happen when we have to sell back out. When we sell back out, we're going to drive the prices down. So now what you see is the impact-adjusted leverage goes shooting up and is much higher than the other ones. 
And now, to Ronald's question, what happens when you sell out of this? When you sell out of it, under, under mark to market accounting, when you sell out, you depress prices, and the effect that you have in lowering prices actually dominates over, because the impact is infinite at the origin, it dominates always, on average, I mean, on average, it will always dominate the effect of getting rid of the shares, at least at first. As you sell out, that flips over and the opposite happens. But initially, the leverage always rises and then it falls, which means that when you're thinking about your bank and they're monitoring your margin, you better be careful because if you didn't have this in mind, you're very likely, as you start selling out, to get a margin call if you have enough impact to do this effect. Now, in the second panel, what I show is exactly the same thing, the only difference being that I change the impact of the trade, total impact from 0.15 to 0.19. So in other words, you take a little bit bigger position relative to this liquidity of this asset. What happens in this case going in looks very similar when you look at market market accounting. What happens going out looks quite dramatic because what happens going out is you've, your position is so big that the impact you make drives you bankrupt when you go out. So your leverage actually goes to infinity when you're exiting a position. And what we've done here actually is, is put in the critical line, you should have stopped there. Now the nice thing about our impact adjusted valuation formula is it shows you as you're going in that um, you're in serious trouble. So in other words, it warns you because it starts to blow up as you're, as you're uh, buying into the position because it warns you what's going to happen when you get out of it. Now, I'm a little nervous about, how much time do I have, Fabrizio? 20 minutes, okay. Well, let me just say that this can all be, what I've done up till now assumes that market, market impact is just a deterministic function. But in reality, it's quite noisy. And it has the property that the bigger the impact, the bigger the noise. The noise, in fact, is scaling in a square root way, just like the impact. And, um, and you can take that into account. So that's really what the next two slides say. You can take that into account. And you can have a noisy version of this, and anything you can do, any calculation you can do with VAR, you can use a noisy model that includes the impact and redo that calculation, and then you can then turn this into probabilities of failure or probabilities of achieving a loss of a given size, and you can show that you can have substantial effects on a VAR calculation due to uh, this kind of thing, particularly when you have leverage. Now, Question, does this ever happen in real markets? I mean, is this just a fantasy and extreme case that's kind of a quirky mathematical oddity, or are there who have actually done this to themselves? And so our, we, we tried to calculate under the assumption of a um, position that's equal to 10 times daily volume, we calculated the critical leverage, that is the leverage where you, the leverage goes to infinity on an exit, um, for different assets. And for something like the Bunch or the S&P 500, that critical leverage is very high. But on something like Club Med stock or CDS, it's quite low. I mean, a leverage of 7.5 is not that high by um, you know, investment banking standards. So I think it's quite possible that during the crisis and at other points in time, people have actually driven themselves bankrupt simply by their own leverage. Because notice, this whole effect doesn't require anything else going on in the market. You just do it to yourself. Yeah. Pardon? Yes. The, the, the default swap. Yeah. Um, pardon me? Um, yeah, that's a good question, and I shouldn't guess at the answer because Jean Philippe actually made this table. Uh, so, and I don't know. I should. Um, um, okay. So now, I want to go on to talk about a generalization of this idea. What I did there was a single asset portfolio. I now want to talk about it for multi-asset portfolios, which is more realistic case and is more relevant to the notion of contagion. So, you know, most work so far on financial contagion in the sort of network community has focused on cascading failures due to inter institutional lending, that is counterparty and rollover risk. 
you lend money to somebody else, either they default and don't pay it back, or you're used to having them lend money to you and then the market tightens up and they no longer lend money to you, but since you're counting on that money, that stresses you and then, and then something bad happens. But if you go to the Fed or places, central bankers generally believe that the main vector of contagion in the crisis was actually the fact that financial institutions had overlapping portfolios and they were leveraged. Those two things I'm going to try and show um, combined together badly here. Um, so we're going to use impact as a rule and combine that together to compute the network effects. And so we're in particular going to look at N funds that are holding an average of MUBI assets out of M possible assets and ask how does the contagion depend on those parameters and also on the leverage and the market impact. Um, so just to think about this problem, you can think about it as a bipartite network where the elements in the bipartite network are the funds or the banks over here and the assets over here. And when banks hold common assets, that introduces contagion. So by the way, this applies to not just to banks, it applies to hedge funds and any funds that are using leverage to uh, manage their assets. Uh, I may call them banks though. Um, so, um, if you think about the diagram I just showed, then you can see that if, if we're now looking at the banks over here, here's the bipartite network, there's a projected network that, that makes implicit connections between the banks when they hold common assets, and so you can see how as you look at those linkages, you're connecting different banks together. Now, so what I'm going to show you is a kind of stylized stress test where we go in and we depress the value of a randomly chosen asset or we drive a randomly chosen bank out of business. Um, we're going to assume the funds are leveraged, and, um, but if, if they go out of business, they, they sell, I should, as, as needed, if they go out of business, they sell all their assets. Um, so, and a fund that goes out of business just sells off all its assets. So when that happens, we use market impact to recompute the price of the assets. We then look and see if that recomputation causes any more funds to become insolvent. And then we iterate that until we reach a point where no more funds are becoming insolvent as we go along. And we'll arbitrarily, for the purpose of these simulations, say that a contagion event has occurred if more than 5% of the funds fail. Um, so, but let me first just show you, uh, presaging the, the theory that we've been developing, is suppose we had the portfolios of the 100 largest banks, like the Fed just hands it to us and says, here are the 100 largest banks, this is what they hold. So let I and J represent banks, let QIA be the position of bank I and asset A, let this theta function be something that's zero if X is negative and one if it's positive, um, let FA be a market impact function, and let EI be the equity, then you can just write down a formula that describes a matrix that describes the probability that bank I fails given that bank J failed. And, and furthermore, you can, you can sweep through the assets, in this case, since we're using it, if we're using a deterministic impact function, it's just, this is just a matrix of zeros or ones, it either fails or it doesn't fail, and um, and you can sweep through the assets, and basically what this formula does is it says, um, uh, if this bank fails due to a depression on the price of this asset, or, or multiple assets, um, how big is that impact, and is the change in the assets of the bank large enough that it drives that bank bankrupt, and which means that it has an entry of one. In other words, if, if bank J failed, is their failure sufficient to cause bank I to fail, and now we're talking about the failure that's strictly induced by the common asset holdings of those two banks. Okay, so you could write down this matrix, and it turns out you can model this via a Galton, -Walton, Galton Watson process, which was introduced in the 19th century to think about the survival of family names. Um, but basically, you can just compute the eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue of this matrix. If that largest eigenvalue is greater than one, then you're going to see an instability and financial contagion will be amplified. Um, so it's a purely mechanical model. We're not taking into account what these banks might do as they're approaching failure. We're assuming it happens so fast they're caught flat-footed and they're either wiped out or they aren't. Um, all right, so now, 
To make the analytic model, we make some other approximations. We actually simplify things by letting now i and j represent the degrees of the banks, that is, how many other banks, or how many assets is the, are the bank connected to, and how many assets is this bank connected to, and so we look at the expected number of funds that will fail because of the failure of a fund with, of, of degree i that will fail due to a fund with degree j. And as before, the, the, if the largest eigenvalue is greater than one, we get a cascade. For convenience, we make some assumptions that are highly unrealistic, like the size of the balance sheet is the same for all funds. All banks are of the same size. 80% of each fund's assets are liquid. The portfolio weights are uniform. Funds all have the same initial equity. And for the analytic calculations, we let N and M go to infinity because, you know, this eigenvalue, the instability is only defined in an infinite limit. Um, and we also assume an erdos renyi graph by assuming there's just a random probability that a given bank is going to be connected to a given asset. This parameter, which turns into this parameter, will affect, is effectively the diversification parameter. How many assets are each bank holding? So now we want to know, as a function of these parameters, as we vary the diversification or the crowding, which is the number of institutions, the number of banks divided by the size of the universe of assets and the leverage, what do we see? Well, so actually I'll just skip that slide, it's not important. Um, we run these, these stress tests, and now what I plot is, as a function of the diversification parameter, what's the probability that we have a contagion event and what's the extent in the red the, of that event? So what we see is there's a region over here where um, there are no contagion events. Why is that? Simply because banks are unconnected to other banks. Banks are hardly diversifying at all. They're, they're hardly investing. I mean, they have very concentrated portfolios relative to the size of the space, so there's no overlaps. As they start to have overlaps, we see an explosion in the probability of contagion, but then the probability of contagion comes back down because over in this region, as, um, um, as you achieve more um, sharing of the risk, the system becomes more capable of absorbing it, and out here, out here, the system, you, you again have no contagion events because the system is able to absorb it because the entire system absorbs it instead of just some subset of banks. So there's a trade-off. You also see, though, that the system is robust, yes, yet fragile in the sense that out in this region, contagion events are getting rare, but when they occur, they're catastrophic. The whole system goes down because in this region up here, the graph is, is highly connected. There, there's a, a giant component. Now, so you can do vary parameters. Here I vary the crowding parameter. And uh, what we see as we, we have more crowding, we shift the contagion window to the left. That is, we, we um, in this case, increase the number of institutions relative to the size of the asset space. As we do that, we shift this off to the left. As we vary, we can look at asset versus fund failure. And what we see is that, in other words, are we shocking it by shocking an asset, by saying suddenly for some unexplained reason this price of this asset goes down, or are we shocking it by causing a bank to fail? And we see slightly different behavior in terms of the magnitude because the size of the initial shocks are different, but what we see is you see exactly the same threshold for the contagion window. That is, the region where you see instabilities and failures is exactly the same, it doesn't matter. Now, why is that? It's because of what, what I was alluding to a minute ago about the Galton-Watson process, that the system is either unstable or it isn't. And if it's unstable, it amplifies instabilities. If it's not, it doesn't. Um, uh, you can vary leverage, and as you would expect, as you increase leverage, things get worse. But interestingly, they only get worse. Uh, we're again sweeping the diversification parameter. They get worse on this side. They don't get worse on that side. Meaning, it, yeah, it's only in the high diversification limit that changing the leverage makes a difference. And we can, in fact, see that in this three-dimensional plot we've made here where we have the crowding parameter on this axis, the diversification parameter on this axis, and the leverage on this axis. So we see that 
there's a critical threshold of leverage where the system's just stable regardless of what the other parameters are. As the leverage goes above that threshold, depending on what the other parameters are, the system might or might not be stable, but the size of the region where it's unstable gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and this is just looking at the same thing. So now we plot leverage versus, or sorry, crowding versus diversification. And here we plot leverage versus diversification. Um, and so this is also to just compare the analytic model to just a, a brute force simulation. Uh, what you can see is that the analytic model does a very good job of predicting the onset of the instability in this side. It does not quite as good a job. It undershoots a little bit here. And there's two effects going on here. One of them is the finite size effect. The real world doesn't have an infinite number of assets or institutions. Um, um, the, the other thing that's going on, though, is that um, you have to worry about loops. That is, bank J failing alone is not sufficient to cause institution I to fail. But if bank J causes bank K to fail, then the failure of both K and J is sufficient to cause I to fail. And this Galton-Watson approximation doesn't, doesn't include that, although we have an idea for a ex perturbation expansion of it that would. Um, and that's, so the, the, the estimates off for both those reasons. Now, um, future work. Uh, we're in the process of making dynamic models uh, inspired in part by Fabrizio and Fulvio's work, which it's too bad you guys aren't talking about here because I really like that work. Um, we're going to try and calibrate these models against real data. Uh, we think it could be very useful to actually compute this matrix for real banks, we, we hope that this analysis gives us some insight into, well, I, let me, I'll say that on the next slide. And, and then we're also trying to incorporate some of this into agent-based models where we can take some decision-making by the banks leading up to these events into account, um, or maybe quite in, in advance of these events. Because, uh, of course, banks are always managing their portfolios to try and avoid this kind of thing. So, so in our agent-based model, we will try and capture that. Um, so let me just summarize. Market impacts useful substitute for excess demand. I think I've shown that here by just showing you that, A, things are simple when you do them this way. And B, because we have some idea about the functional form, we're not just making some arbitrary choice with some demand and supply functions that we're just pulling out of the air or making some unrealistic assumptions about utility that we then derive under some equilibrium, and again, we get some unrealistic answer. Um, uh, now, with, with that said, I have to make a caveat because, you know, generally what we've assumed is that you have that square root function which involves an orderly execution. Under disorderly processes, that may be out the window, and I don't think we understand very well what fire sale do, although Pete is suggesting that maybe we do. I mean, you're making a proposal that your, your proposal should explain that, um, which then would be cool, and I'm actually stimulated that maybe we ought to go back and test that. Um, I've tried to argue that accounting should take market impact into account. To me, this is just a no-brainer. I think you can quibble about whether we have exactly the right impact function, but I think that ought to be the debate. I think regulators and private investors should all be doing that. Um, tried to argue that market impacts the vector of contagion and that we can make simple models. Now let me just say, what did we really achieve in the model? By making these rather strong assumptions, we were able to investigate how things changed as we varied properties of the network or as we varied the strength of the interactions like liquidity on the network um, or, or the leverage that the players are using. I think that's very important because if the Fed does hand us their data, and we compute this matrix, all we can say is, dear Fed, we think you know, the eigenvalue is now 0.8. So it's kind of bad, but not too bad. Let's, you know, but then how do, you, how do you get it down to 0.6? Um, and so I think the calculation we made, or perhaps more realistic versions of it, where you actually understand how this depends on the, the whole system, allows you to get some insight in, into what, what the cause and effect of this is. And I just want to make one final comment, which is kind of a philosophical comment. I've had many of my papers rejected because they, they, uh, they have no economic content. Now, 
I would be really hurt by that if economic content meant what a normal person would think it would mean. You might think it means that you're not explaining anything about the economy. But actually what they mean is something very specific. My paper is being rejected because I am not deriving anything that has to do with agents selfishly maximizing their own utility. And in fact, they go so far as to say, therefore, you do not have a theory. It's a very strange nomenclature to an outsider. Um, but I actually think that oftentimes, first of all, that's a good thing, because if your results are robust under those kind of strong behavioral assumptions, that's good. But secondly, I think there are a lot of situations like what I've described here where a structure is more important than strategy. I'm not sure there's the right way to say this, but what I've been showing you are things that are essentially mechanical. I haven't talked about strategic motivations of players, and for a lot of stuff, I don't think you need to do that. I think if we had just been monitoring the mechanics of the market, we would have seen the crisis coming without without having to understand all the strategic motivations that led us into the crisis in the first place. And so I think there's a lot of uh, important first order stuff to do that just has to do with understanding the structure, understanding institutional constraints, and understanding mechanics of the market, and, um, and even if you can't get your papers published in top journals because they're rejected because you don't have a economic content. Thanks. If you use the square root function and you have 100 institutions uh, holding equal quantities as an asset, and then you change your model so that 50 institutions each hold twice as much, and then all of those institutions just dump the asset, does your square root model imply that the 100 assets dumping the small positions have bigger impact than the 50 assets dumping the bigger positions? No, I, I don't think so, because you'll notice amount. that we put, um, we're putting the impact um, Actually, did we do this right here? Let me think. I would, say, I would say no, it should be about the same because the key thing is how much execution is happening. You know, if you have, just to make it simpler, two people executing simultaneously, you and I make the same bet at the same time, then we're behaving like one agent, you know, making that bet. And that's built into your model. I hope so. If we did it right, it's built in. No, but it's a question of what you count as Q. So really the question is, and you could still have a square root, but the question is, how do you account for the correct value of Q? So what is Q? So Q is, um, Q, Q is, is you, you have, when you have situations where people are literally sailing simultaneously, in those situations, you need to aggregate the players together in order to get the correct value of Q. Yeah, so then that's not what people call price impact when you, when I want to trade, what I call my price impact is uh, what, how that affects my own shortfall. So if you're saying that I need to know what the other guy is trading to compute Q, then uh, maybe that's why you're finding a square root because you're aggregating across, you know, the simultaneous trades and the square root may be due to this aggregation phenomena. And you could get square root from a linear price from right? aggregation phenomena, and that actually gives you a very different, very different thing. And you know, I think the other key thing here that that may be important, and this is a good discussion, uh, it's triggering me to think about something. We've done studies where we use brokerage data, Fabrizio and I and others. We use brokerage data to try and back out the size of the big bets and the linked trades. And when you do that, what you see is there's much less overlap between these things than you might think. That is, you can have large trades going on at the same time, but, um, but you know, there aren't that many large trades being initiated at the same, on the same day in a typical market. And, and um, so, at least for most purposes, it is true that what we're doing when we use the square root is we're looking at those things individually. So, but uh, but it, I just want to clarify that the Q I think in your framework is the size of the trade as opposed to the size of an individual order. The way you break it up is not in the queue, right? Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, normally I am thinking it is the size of an individual order, but, but 
Pete's point is well taken that when two people literally behave simultaneously, one needs to aggregate those. So there's, there's that ambiguity sitting there. Yeah, um, you assume all banks to be of the same size, which is of course flying against this very strong evidence that they are zip slow distributed. Uh, you may remember that I, we developed with Malevern um, a model showing that the capital asset pricing model is fundamentally wrong as soon as you take into account the, the zip slow distribution of firm size or bank size and so on. And you need a new factor that completely changed the picture of uh, how the market is and so on. So I was wondering how you know, your result, the stability and so on would change given the fact that as opposed to the n goes to infinity, m goes to infinity limit, when Zips low holds, you are basically controlled by 20 banks. Yeah. And so a lot, you know, the finance size effect, or I mean, some, something fundamentally different would, would, yeah. would occur. So I, should I believe what you say in, the, in this democratic limit if only 20 uh, banks count? Actually? No, no, so I, I completely agree that, you know, in this formula here, you see that the distribution of the, of the asset portfolios is gonna make a big difference. You could have 1,000 banks, but if most of the wealth is concentrated in 50 banks, you probably don't need to worry about the other banks. And, and tails could certainly make an important difference. We haven't studied that. We just made the easiest model that we could tackle. The paper isn't even quite done yet. Uh, so we're just doing the first case. And I completely agree with you that it's a very important thing to investigate what happens under more realistic assumptions and that heavy tails may distort things. Now, one thing, let me just say, I would be curious to look at studies of what the distribution of bank sizes actually is, Yoni Schwarzkopf and I did a study on mutual fund size. We did a very careful study on that, and you have a very nice database because of the, um, uh, what do you call it, the um, CRISP database. And what we saw very clearly is it's a log normal distribution. It is not a heavy tailed, I mean it's heavy tailed, but it's a log normal heavy tail, it's not a power law tail. I'm curious about that with banks, I don't know. Uh huh. Really? Interesting. Huh. Huh. Well, just pointing out about mutual funds, clearly there is no leverage, so you don't have the tails. This is the, the key point. But uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the timing? You know, I'm not an expert of this kind of thing, but in this kind, kind of dynamic networks that clearly, you know, you have these shocks that, uh, because of this large trade and so on, that will spill over in the rest of the, of the market. How much is the timing? Is something that, you know, realize and end up uh, in a few minutes, one day, month? What is the dimension that we are talking about? This is the first question. And second, you know, uh, we are all, all using the word contagion. It's maybe just a semantic point, but are we distinguishing between contagion and spillover, or uh, is always the same? So, uh, in my definition of contagion is that you have a, a huge change of the structure. So, you know, because of the shock of one individual, you have a sort of uh, effect that it has been uh, amplified by the structure. So, this shock will be will have an impact on the rest of the system that is larger than the amount of the shock. Uh, in your system, is this the, the, the result of the contagion or is just the spillover that one default just make the other to default? No, it's, it's oh, so let me answer the two questions. It's, the, the time question is a good question. I think this model is too stylized to address that in a, in a clear way. Um, uh, so I can't, can't really answer that very well. It's one reason we want to make a dynamic model where I think we could sensibly put in a notion of time and actually other things become much, uh, much better when we make that kind of model. Um, now, regarding your question, I think the key point is that the eigenvalue is greater than one, so you are, you are amplifying the contagion as it goes along, and the contagion is being amplified by the leverage. The leverage is actually acting as an amplification mechanism. It's the leverage combined with the impact. So that's why I wanted to develop those two ideas in this talk. You know, the point is the bank goes broke because they're leveraged, um, they, I mean, as you pointed out, a mutual fund, if you're not leveraging, you can't lose more than the assets you have under management. Now, you could get something a bit like this because 
You know, on the other hand, a mutual fund that loses, say, 30% of its assets under management is very likely to go broke and then have to sell off the rest of the assets. And we saw something kind of like that in the um, Statar meltdown in August of 2007. Um, though most Statarbs were leveraged, but I'm not sure that was the key point because they were being pulled out for really arbitrary reasons. Um, but, but in this process, you go broke, you sell the asset, and and then the market impact transmits the contagion and it's because the combination of the leverage and the impact are large enough that you can get this branching process exploding. So it is an amplification mechanism. It's an instability. At the end, that one idea was to go to the Fed and say, now we compute the eigenvalues of B, and maybe it's the largest eigenvalue is 0.8, so it's okay, but if it is 0.9, then there is some action to take. Yeah. It's sort of alternative proposal to what sometimes people say, that central banks should target uh, uh, asset bubbles and be careful about... Uh, so I was wondering if you have thought of going back to what said at the beginning, where you thought that somehow the inefficiencies were responsible for financial instability. And if you can, I mean, somehow make a comment, if you think you can compare the eigenvalue of B in some cases with some yeah. situations where everybody agrees there was a bubble or everybody agrees that there was an instability, your choice. I mean, it... Yeah. Uh, so, so on the first question, I think the analogous thing to think about is what's called a macroprudential stress test. And it was a meeting at the Office of Financial Research a month ago or something, a couple months ago, where you know it was on stress testing and people described how they do this. And it's a very kind of Byzantine, Rube Goldberg process, I would say. They have to assume specific scenarios. And they lay out these scenarios and it, it's very dependent on lots of arbitrary assumptions. Not that we don't have some arbitrary assumptions floating around, but computing the eigenvalue of this matrix is just asking a, a sort of a spot question. Is the system unstable? You don't have to specify a scenario. Um, so that's why I like that. Uh, now, on your other point about inefficiency, let me just uh, say that I'm very keen to actually map out some real market ecologies. That's one reason I go to the Office of Financial Research whenever they invite me, because I'm eager to get my hands on some data with some identifiers where you could potentially map out the ecology, and if you know things about what the agent's basic decision rules are, then you can look and see how this ecology is responding as it goes along. One of the things you have to think about with the ecology is what are the profit relationships? Who's making a profit and how are they making that profit? And how does their basic trading rule, is it stabilizing or destabilizing the market? Pete was talking yesterday about mechanisms where people end up selling into falling markets and buying into rising markets. We have an agent-based paper with uh, Stefan Turner and John Genicopoulos where we show that leverage causes people to do exactly that in general. Just make, making your margin calls causes that to happen as a generic phenomenon. And we argue, well, we show it gives heavy tails and clustered volatility. They're just created endogenously once you make that kind of model. So I think that's an example of the key thing about leverage. Who's using the leverage? What kind of strategy are they using? What kind of instabilities is it inducing? And let's go back and understand the profit and loss relationships related to whether this group is going to grow or shrink. And then maybe we can think about doing regulation with a very soft touch. So I think one of the goals should be to regulate in a minimal way for a maximal effect. And I think unless you understand the ecology, you're just not going to be able to do that. 